Thanks so much for inviting me to do this, Steve. I'm excited to see all you all. Uh, for those of you who are actually in Utah on the other side of the hills, right, just over the over the ridges that I can see off to the west, off to your east. Um, uh, so nice to be here. Um, I actually, so we are going to talk about improvisation and talk about how, um, at least in my experience, learning a little bit about improv actually makes you a better coach and business partner and teacher and whatever it is you're doing in your day-to-day -day job, leader, manager, whatever it is. Um, so we're going to experiment with some techniques and just um, see how it can help you to get comfortable with um, getting a little bit out of your head and being a little bit more in the moment um, and being present. And so we're going to play, we're going to play with some games, do some fun things. Don't worry, I'm not going to put any of you guys on the spot. Um, we're going to do a lot of things together. And if um, we might do a couple of games where if you want to volunteer to be a little more on the spot, you can, but I, I won't force that on anybody. People get worried about that. Um, uh, but I thought uh, Steve gave a nice intro. I thought maybe I'd give you a little bit more of my background um, just in case that's interesting to you. So um, I think I've had every job in an engineering team except developer. Um, and then I eventually managed engineering teams. And this was back in the early 2000s. And I was working with the smartest people I had ever met. And everybody was always um, dissatisfied with what we were doing. And I couldn't figure out why we could never be successful when we, everybody was so smart. And um, some, somebody introduced me to this thing called Agile. And I was like, I am too busy to learn about that. And then about three months later, I was like, oh, I guess I actually should learn about this. And I did. And I, was, I brought that into my teams. And we started being much more successful. And I realized, aha. Here's the thing, it's not us, it was the way we were working that's really the problem. Um, and so then I ended up becoming an Agile coach at a company called Rally Software um, in about 2007. Um, I have also been a CST, a Certified Scrum Trainer since 2008. So I've taught a lot of Agile classes. Um, and while I was at Rally, I got the opportunity to move into a leadership role leading our professional services organization, and I gained a lot of empathy for what it means to be an executive of a, um, inside of a fast scaling company. And so I decided to take what I knew about Agile and teams and work and structure and shifted my focus probably for about the last decade to coaching executives and executive teams. Um, and as Steve mentioned, um, this just this year in March, I actually joined a company called Insight Partners, which is an investment firm. I've never worked in the financial side of things before, so that's been really fun to learn about. Um, but we have a division of our company that's totally dedicated to providing coaching and support to our portfolio companies. So I'm basically doing the same thing, which is coaching executives just inside of a closed, closed system at Insight. So, um, so that's the fast story about me. Um, as far as improv, um, about eight years ago, I decided I wanted to try improv. I didn't really know very much about it. I found some, um, a place, actually, I was actually looking at stand-up comedy, which is different. Sometimes people think that they're the same, but stand-up comedy is um, uh, pre-designed. The jokes are tested, written, there's a flow designed to it. Um, Stand-up comedians will do um, improv as part of their act, but the act is scripted. Um, improv is completely improvised, thus the name. Um, and so I found this, um, I, I was looking for stand-up stuff and I found an improv class and I decided to go try it and um, completely caught me off guard. I don't think I understood what it was. Um, and I remember in my first couple classes realizing how much it matched to what I understood about agility. Um, because improv is a team sport and it's all about um, building relationships with the people you are doing improv with and supporting each other, collaborating um, and finding ways to work together to deliver your value, which in the case of improv is um, taking care of the audience and giving them something to enjoy. Um, and so I got really excited about this idea that there was this whole other world where there was this te these techniques and ideas that were all about teams and relationships and connecting, but didn't have anything to do with software, um, but that I could learn something that I could bridge the two worlds. So that's what I wanted to share with you guys is um, some of the things I've learned in improv, and we'll do it through experience because that's the best way to learn. I, as, if any of you are doing agile coaching, my guess is when you want to teach people about agile, you just have them do stuff. And so we're going to do the same thing as well. Um, but I'd love to know um, if anybody on the call already actually has experience with improv. Um, maybe you could either pop off mute and tell me or you could pop something in the chat. Um, I always like to know if there's other improvisers in the room because you guys have great experience too. Um, and uh, uh, it's nice to have that. Does, does my kids running in while I'm in a meeting count as improv? 
Yeah, how you respond to it definitely does. <laughs> We've all gotten much better at that, I think, um, which is so great. And I actually, I, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say they don't love when they get to see other people's kids or pets running into the thing. It's, it's been a, a, a small joy during uh, some challenging time. Anybody else have any uh, improv experience? Anybody done anything? Bunch of newbies, fun. Okay, cool. Um, only in sports. Let's see, what'd you say, Kurt? Only in sports when the play doesn't go how you want. Yep, that's improvisation. Um, nice improv brown bag. I like that. Cool. Oh, theater, singing, dance. Yep, so improv can exist in many other spaces. Thanks, Lorena. Um, so yeah, we're gonna be talking about improvised theater, but obviously there's improvised music. Jazz is a perfect example, right? Yep, that Justin with the jazz improv, right? So, um, but we'll, we'll be talking more about what improvised theater is. And so just a little bit of information about improv in the theater world. Um, so there are two forms of theater improv. Um, one is probably the one you're more familiar with, which is called short form. That's the improv that you see on like a show, like whose line is it anyway? It's games. It's like, you know, it's like playing off of each other. There are short um, structures in which people will improvise. Any people seen whose line it is, is it anyway? Is that show familiar to people? So you get that feeling of it's a lot of games. It's a lot of like, like, you know, getting put in kind of like funny situations or playing different characters. But, but so improv has form, it has structure, um, but within the structure, all of the content is created. So sometimes people wonder like, how can you rehearse improv? Well, what you learn is the form, but in the moment, the what choices you make and what ends up happening is completely improvised, never before created. Um, and so that's, in some ways feels sometimes like what we do in Agile, right? We have form, we have structure, um, but what happens every day and what gets created in the team is improvised in the moment based on the information that we have, the people that we have, the market that we're in, the, sk the skills that we have, right? All of that stuff feeds it in, but we use structure and form in order to create some boundaries and some um, space in which we can work together. So improv is very similar in that way. So that's short form, and that's actually what we're going to be playing with today, some little games. The improv that I actually spent most of my time doing is actually called long form, and that's where you improvise whole scenes or even whole theater productions from start to finish. Um, and that, so you're, you're creating more of like a longer story where things start to kind of link together, but again, it's, it's all improvised. Um, so, but, but that, that's something that's for another day. Well, let's start with the short form, um, <laughs> cause I think that'll be enough. Um, the other thing I'll say about improv, um, is that what makes, Im what makes improvised theater funny is truth. Um, so if you ever see an improv show, and this is true, if you see a comedian, what we tend to laugh at the most is when when comedians or improvisers hit on something that is true. And that makes us laugh, right? Because we can all say like, oh yeah, that's, that's a great way to look at that reality that we've all experienced. Or like, what a funny way to kind of capture this mundane thing that we all sort of know about in our lives, right? Th that is where comedy comes from, is from truth. Um, and I, again, I love to kind of bridge that to our work, which is that um, when, when teams are able to get to a place where they can be comfortable enough with each other, that like the truth of how we're going to work and who we are and what we're creating comes out is where the good stuff really lies. Um, and so I, finding those, the, the truths in everything, I think is another part of, of where I find a nice bridge from improv into agile. Okay, so that's enough about like the context, but hopefully that starts to give you some ideas as we play with some of this about like, well, why would this be useful for me, whether it's something that I got a chance to kind of experience this one time or multiple times, or maybe I start thinking about bringing improv games into my team as a way to sort of do icebreakers or team meeting kickoffs. It's all about creating these environments in which we can get out of our heads and just be present with each other um, and, and find something true um, to be there. So that's, I guess, the roundabout way of saying it's actually not funny in improv when you're trying to be funny. It's funny when you're not trying to be funny. Does that make sense? So that was another good learning for me. It's like, if you're forcing it, the audience knows and it feels weird. Um, it's better to just be truthful and 
the, the comedy comes. So let's try out a few improv games. So when improvisers work together, they warm up um, because it's not something you can just sort of fall into. And that's a good thing to pay attention to for your teams. If we want teams to collaborate and be present with each other and work together, sometimes we need to warm up to that. Sometimes maybe we've been at our desks for three hours and haven't talked to anybody, or we've been isolated in our houses for, you know, 20 months and we're not exactly sure how to collaborate anymore, right? So warm-ups, like build, rebuilding those muscles is actually a very important part of improv. And I think actually a skill that we don't, a muscle we don't flex enough in the work world of like, gosh, it's been a while since I've done this. Maybe we should do some practice rounds and make sure that everybody's ready to kind of jump in and start talking to each other. Um, so we're going to do that. So um, Obviously in Zoom world, improv is a little different. There's a lot of activities that improvisers do that are physical um, or at least require more physical interaction, um, but we're gonna do some that don't, which is great because a lot of you are probably gonna be remote maybe forever, right? If your jobs have changed to that. So good to figure out how to do it this way. So the first game we're gonna play is just actually to get us all focused on each other, paying attention and kind of moving in the same direction. So this game, most improv games have names that do not make any sense. So just know that. So this game's called Kamehameha, um, <laughs> which is a volcano. Um, and, but the game is that, and uh, this will work better if people are willing to turn on their cameras. So if you aren't in the middle of shoving lunch in your face or like driving in your car, um, if you can turn on your camera, this game works better that way. Um, we're actually gonna play a game in a minute where I'm gonna tell you to turn your cameras off. So um, you'll get a break. Um, but I'm basically, imagine that I have a ray gun, like, uh, you know, alien technology and it can shoot through Zoom. And so I am gonna shoot my ray gun at the screen and I'm gonna shoot it either this way or this way or up or down. And you all have to dodge my shot. So if we're doing this well, what's gonna happen is if I point it this way, everybody's gonna go like that at the same time, right? Cause I'm shooting here, right? I wanna, I'm trying to make my finger point as directionally as I can so you're not confused, but I'm shooting here. So you're gonna dodge away from it. And if I shoot up, you're gonna duck down. And if I shoot down, you're gonna pop up, okay? So there's gonna be some physical movement here and you don't know which way I'm gonna shoot. And we're gonna see if we can get this whole group moving in the same direction, right? So this is just, you, and, and the goal here is you need to pay attention to me. You need to pay attention to your screen, you need to be focused and you just need to let your body react. So this is a warm up because what we're doing is bringing our mind into a place of being centered, being focused, letting all the other stuff around us sort of drift away and paying attention to what this team is doing. Yes, Jonathan, excellent modeling of the uh, Kamehameha ray gun avoidance. Okay, so questions about how to do this activity. Does it make sense? I am going to start shooting, so prepare yourselves. Ready? Yay! I'll make it easy for you at first. I go in the opposite direction? Yeah, so you're, you're dodging my shot. So if I point down, you gotta go up. And if I point up with my gun, you gotta duck down, right? Cause you're avoiding my ray gun. So that's the other piece is like, you're having to think what's the opposite of what Rachel is doing, right? So again, like encouraging the brain to just like really be in the moment and pay attention. Okay, so you ready? So you got to, we got did one round. Now I'm going to get crazy. Okay, I'm going to start adding sound effects. Pew! 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 Yay, very good. Did you see how we kind of got into a rhythm at the end there? Right, so that's the kind of, that's warm ups are all about like pushing until you get to that place of like, okay, we're, we're here, like we're paying attention, I'm in, like I stopped paying attention to all that other stuff that was happening around me. I was very focused on this moment here. And it's about getting into rhythm with the team, right? Finding like, okay, we're here together. We can, and, and also, you know, the, energy and the fun that comes with just being silly because we're grown-ups and we don't do that enough right like so part of improv is also just like 
not being embarrassed that you're doing something silly because everybody else is doing it too. Okay, so that's a good one. Nice, fun one. You can do it on Zoom. Creates a lot of fun energy. You can get crazy with it. You can modify it. But that's one. that one's a great warming up starting place. This next one I want to play with you um, um, doesn't have an interesting name other than counting to 20. <laughs> so this is not one of the weirdly named ones. But this is really about getting in a mental space to do shared work. So if you have a team that's coming together to like whiteboard, solve a tough problem, do some really, in, you know, engaged planning, have like a deep retrospective, something like that, and, and you want to get brains focused, this is a nice one for that. And again, not hard to do remotely. Um, so the way that this is going to work, we're a big enough group that I actually think I'm going to put us into breakout rooms for this. So I want to make sure we understand the game before I send you off so that um, you know what's happening. So the goal here is as a team to count to 20, which sounds easy, but we will be turning off our cameras, not yet, but when we go, cameras will be off, but mics will be on. And in counting to 20, only one person can say each number. If any, at any point in counting, two people say the same number at the same time, you need to go back to one. And you don't know who's going to say wh what number. We just, as a group, need to get to 20. So somebody will say one, and then somebody else will say two, and then three, and so on, with the goal being no more than one person saying each number. Does that make sense? So if at some point, which will inevitably happen, two people say five, we go, oops, and we start over again at one. And you just keep going and try to get all the way up to 20. Does that make sense? There's no like who starts, who finishes. There's no rules. We're a team. We can't see each other. We're just listening and we're doing our best to get there. And we're going to go back to one many times. That's totally okay. <laughs> but we're going to keep on and pushing and try to get as close to 20 as we can. Okay. So questions about how this game works, because I won't be able to be in all three rooms at the same time um, as you guys try to do this. So go ahead, questions? Okay, so remember, mic's on, but camera's off. You don't want to be able to see each other. So it's a, it's a no visual. So if you were doing this in person, everybody would close their eyes. That's how you do it when you do it in person. This is actually where Zoom actually comes in quite handy to play this game. Um, and again, it doesn't matter who starts, but somebody needs to start. And if two people say one at the same time, what do you do? Start over. Start over, right? You just go right back to one and somebody starts it off. Okay. And then you and no, just- No, no verbal organization. We exactly. can only speak numbers in our breakout rooms. Exactly. And it's like, and it does not, it's not a bad thing if two people say the number at the same time. It just means we get to start over again, right? Um, and you're going to get as far as you can in the time box. We'll close the breakout rooms at some point and I'll just close them and bring you guys all back here. Um, and then we'll just kind of talk about what happened. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so let's see, how many people do we have? 22. I think I'm going to do three breakout rooms. Um, that should give a nice amount in each one. So I'm going to open the breakout rooms. So if everybody will um, follow, you should get a message in your Zoom that says join breakout room and um, hop over there. And then um, once your group is there, yeah, I mean, you can talk before you start, but somebody can say like, okay, let's begin and make sure all your mics are on, your cameras are off and start the counting process. Okay. All right. I'm opening the breakout rooms. Do your best. It's going to be super fun. Here we go. All right, welcome back. Um, and you can turn your video back on if you're comfortable doing that while we debrief this one, um, since, uh, since you had them off in there. But I am so curious, I got, to, I got to play in one room, so I know what happened there, but um, I welcome somebody from that room to share. But let's, so let's start first with, did any teams make it all the way to 20? No, I didn't win. So one team didn't, one team did. Third, third group? No, we got to 15. Oh, good. Okay. All right. So talk a little bit about what that was like. What did you notice? What did you experience trying to do that? My heart was racing. 
What do you, why, why was it racing? Because it's a lot of pressure. And then I'm obnoxious and screamed really loud. <laughs> so that's, I, I mean, I'm sorry you felt that way. And I think this is like part of that, like getting comfortable, right? Is like, how do we create space where people start to feel like, okay, it's okay to put my voice out there. It's okay if I jump in and I accidentally jump in at the same time, same time as somebody else. And like, it, you know, we'll figure out our way of sort of communicating and, and working with each other. But yeah, it can be, it can feel stressful sometimes to have those kind of interactions. Maria? Uh, the longer the pause, the more likely we, w- we were to have two people say the same number. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So did other groups notice that too, that like the faster you went, the easier it was to go one person at a time. But as soon as there was a gap, you were more likely to have two people jump in at the same time. Um, it felt like you're constantly in a kind of a go, no go type of mentality. You know, do I, do I say something or do I wait? Do I say something or wait? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, and then trying to make that final decision of when to you know, make the leap to say, say a number, you know, and mm-hmm. take the risk. One thing that if, if you do this with a team that, you, that I think you will discover, cause I've done this with many different improv teams and it's always happens is that the longer teams work together, the better they get at this. And even with eyes closed and it ha- you know, there's this, just this um, ability that teams get to sort of read each other and sort of know when other people want to take a turn, when other people want to jump in, like what the rhythm of the team is, um, even with eyes closed and which I find very interesting um, that we get better at that. So I, I think that also speaks to like how we communicate as we get more comfortable with people feels more, has more flow than when we're working with a group that we're not as familiar with, which is probably where some of that stress comes from, Kelly. Yeah, because I developed a personal (laughs) strategy, Mm -hmm. saying a number immediately after somebody else did, people start to realize that's my strategy. Yes. Wait for me to do that thing. And then if I don't, they know I'm not. Yes. Yep. So we start to like learn each other's style. Because you can imagine an improv when you're creating theater, it's not great when you talk over each other, right? Like that's, I mean, sometimes that works. Like sometimes that's the right thing, but it doesn't work if that's not what, what the, the scenario sort of is, is speaking to. And so there's, there's part of this in improv, at least, is learning how to make space for other people's voices. That's part of the team experience of improv. But I think it's... Um, to me, that mirrors into agile teams as well. How do we make space for everybody's voice and, and yet still achieve our goal? I mean, did anybody have a group where only one person counted? <laughs> That'd be weird, right? <laughs> everybody else just sits there quietly. Um, but that sometimes happens in teams where you have a loud voice, right? Who kind of takes command over the situation. Any other thoughts on this one? Just one thought. Um, I think we had had to reset a few times. And I think the more that happened, I just noticed my desire to not want to mess up again. And so I think there's probably like that whole psychological safety piece too about uh, how you can recover, how you can just be like, let's just go back rather than dwell on the, you know, wow, we messed up. We almost got there. We have to go back. So I thought that was an interesting thing to notice um, Mm -hmm. along the way. And I, yeah, I love that insight. And I stopped you guys because I couldn't be in all three rooms and I didn't know where people were. But if you were doing this in an improv team, and I would recommend the same for a real team, you don't stop until you succeed. You, you want to get there. Um, and I have definitely like improv team that I had worked with for 18 months. So people that I knew very, very well, we would just have some nights, maybe we were getting ready for a show and we were just off and we would do that for 20 minutes before we would get there. And we would just push through because we knew once we got there, we could all be like, okay, we did, <laughs> right? Like we can do this. Like we, we, we found our groove again, it's gonna be okay. So um, there's some, uh, a nice experience in sort of finally summiting that hill together even when it feels like it's hard um, for whatever reason. Did you notice how focused you needed to be to sort of participate in that? that active listening that you need to be engaged in. I don't know if you do this, but when I have my camera off, I, I, I find myself like this, even though that it's, it's, I can still hear, but there's something about wanting to sort of be close. And if you do this in person with people, what you'll observe is 
people like to get into a circle and they'll like lean their heads in. There's something about that. Like we want to sort of pick up some of that, um, body language, even with our eyes closed. Um, so uh, to me, that says a lot about how we interact on tools like zoom as well. Um, because we don't get that physical presence. And so there's this desire to sort of like pick up more information somehow. Um, so it's interesting to see how our bodies, um, do that. Yeah. Lauren, you said that like getting closer. All right, cool. So two very different um, kind of warming up, remembering how to work together ones, one that's very physical and kind of funny and about rhythm. And then the other that's about lit active listening and engagement and focus, both valuable, um, but kind of targeting different aspects of our brain. So now that you guys are warmed up, now I wanna play something like a little, that takes a little bit more um, kind of brain power and a little bit more collaboration to kind of balance off of each other. So now we're moving from working all together on something to sort of working um, in, in sequence with each other. Um, so one of the things that you learn in improv is that um, uh, anything that somebody tells you, it, um, you should take as true. Like one of the worst things you can do in improv is deny the reality that somebody else is creating. Um, it's jarring to the audience. It's confusing. And it, it's um, you, you want to think of what somebody else is giving you as a gift. Um, and it's sort of like, I hate your gift, <laughs> right? So what that means is this is where improv sort of builds from is that I could walk into a scene with somebody and I could have an idea of what I think is going to happen. I have an idea about who I am. I have an idea about who they are. And maybe I come in and I think, you know, I'm a teenage girl and this person is my dad and I am pissed at him. That's how I feel right now because he won't let me hang out with my boyfriend. So maybe this is like my internal story. And so I walk into the scene and I say to this person, like, I hate you. I never want to see you again. And that person could easily turn to me and say, um, grandma, have you not been taking your medication? I can't deny that, right? Everything, all this truth that I thought I was carrying myself, my big story that I wanted to tell on this stage, I have to let that go because I am this person's grandmother and it's very likely I'm not taking my medication, <laughs> right? And I have to build on that. So I'm still mad at this person. It's clear I have a relationship with them, but now there's this other truth. And now I'm going to say something back and that has to be true as well. And so this is the nature of improv is like letting go of whatever you thought you were going to do, whatever construct you were bringing into the situation, whatever you wanted to own, and instead being present and building a, tr a reality solely off of the information that other people are giving you. And for me, this has been really meaningful and helpful because I don't know how many of you teach or educate or coach or lead, but we often have ideas about how we think things are going to go. And then we bring information into a space and it goes differently. Anybody run into this before? <laughs> and um, if you in that, I mean, we, we don't want meetings to go off the rails, right? We should have agendas and purpose and outcomes. And if people are getting all crazy, we got to bring them back into line. So I'm not saying that you should do that, but if you bring information to a team and you have an idea of how they're going to receive it and what they're going to do with it, and you get different reaction back, denying that actually is harmful to the situation, right? Like, I think we've all felt this when like maybe a, a leader comes to us and they're like, guys, we got great news. Like we're totally redesigning the office. And everybody's like, I hate that news. That's the worst news. I hate you for bringing that news. If that leader is then like, I'm just going to pretend you're all still happy about this and keep going with my plan to talk about rah, rah, rah. What's the reaction of the people in the room? How do we react to that? Yeah. Now we're really pissed, right? They're denying our reality. And so what I, what I love to take from this is like, you will have plans, you will have ideas, you will have expectations, but don't deny the emotion and reaction that people are actually bringing to you. That's real and you need to accept it and make it part of how you're gonna proceed, right? That is how we acknowledge people, how we make, you know, we take, you, you know, you don't, it doesn't mean you have to agree with them, right? It doesn't mean you have to say that they're right. Like when that person says to me, grandma, you're not taking your meds. I can say I am taking my meds, but I'm not going to say I'm not grandma because I am grandma. 
right? So there's like a balance here of what's real and what you can kind of push back against. But when it comes to emotion and reaction, we want to acknowledge that as the lived real experience of the person on the other side. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's where we're kind of going. This next piece is like, what's reality, what's real, and how are other people creating that with us? So we're going to play a game called Fortunately, Unfortunately. And it's pretty simple. Um, I'm going to kick it off with a statement. And then somebody's going to follow on that statement by saying, fortunately, and then additional information. And then the next person is going to follow up with, unfortunately, and additional information. So let's say I said, um, uh, I'm here to let everybody know aliens have landed on Earth. The next person, whoever wants to go next, is going to come off mute and say, fortunately, and then something about the reality that I've just described, which is aliens have landed on Earth. So maybe they say, fortunately, they brought lots of candy and toys with them, right? The next person now has a world in which aliens have landed on Earth. They brought lots of candy and toys, but they're going to start their statement with, unfortunately, they also brought bombs, right? And then the next person is going to say, fortunately, right? But we're always building off of the truth that has already been created. That is the real world. And you are just reacting and adding additional structure, color, content, information to the world that exists. Does that make sense? But because we use the fortunately, unfortunately, it gets kind of fun. Okay. So there's not a good way for me to like order you all into like who goes first, who goes second. This, I think this game is more fun if people just kind of jump in and we just got some experience with that, right? Jumping in on each other. So anybody who wants to take the next turn can, if two people start talking at the same time, one of you goes and the next one waits, right? You just say, go ahead, or you take the turn or whatever, right? It's, uh, you, we just have to figure it out. Um, this is the nature of communication is turn taking. Okay. So we'll just figure it out. So any questions about the game? And we're just going to go until it's too funny and we can't handle it anymore. And then we'll start, we could start another one. So remember the only rules are whatever world is being built is real. You can't, don't deny it. So that's especially important when you're the unfortunately person, you're not deconstructing the world. You're just giving some unfortunate information about the world that exists, okay? Same on the fortunate side. Don't change, don't deconstruct the world. Don't deny the world that we've created. You're just adding additional information to the world that exists. Does that make sense? Okay, so build, build work with each other. This is a collaboration. Okay, any questions? And then I'm gonna think of a good kicker offer for us. No questions. Okay. Um, hey, guys, guess what? Uh, Utah and Colorado are going to combine to become one state. Fortunately, we'll have more Democrats. Unfortunately, all of the Utah ski areas will now be smaller than those bigger Colorado ones. Fortunately, they'll still be closer. Unfortunately, they're going to be more crowded. Fortunately, we'll be able to buy beer easier. <laughs> Unfortunately, it will be the cores that taste like water. <laughs> Fortunately, it'll be less calories to consume. Unfortunately, uh, we all need to be incredibly active, so we're going to need some calories. Fortunately, weed will be will be legal in both in the area. Un unfortunately, we will be so mellow from the weed that we won't know whether we're in Utahrado or Idaho. Fortunately, company policy still prohibits, right? Unfortunately, <clears throat> we'll now be touching Nebraska. Fortunately, there is a really cool wood carousel right on that Nebraska-Utarada border. 
All right, we'll stop that one there. Very <laughs> nicely done. Very nicely done. Um, you guys did great building with each other. And you can see sometimes like a line will sort of die. So it's okay to add new, right? So um, uh, building on the truth that people created doesn't mean you just have to follow the same line. It means you can start other spokes. It's just never deleting the truth that already existed. And you guys did a great job with that. This can be a really fun activity to do around something that a team maybe is unsure about, right? Like, what are we going to do about this? And it can be kind of a fun, weird way to say, like, let's say that a team that you're working with or, or an organization that you're worry, working with is like worried about maybe, maybe you're going to get acquired, right, by another company. And you could do this activity by saying, like, hey, guys, guess what? We got acquired by Oracle and play this and let people sort of play out what is this reality and kind of what are the things that we're worried about or excited about etc and it can and again what it's funny because these are things that are true about how we think about it right so it gives us a chance to sort of express some of the things we feel but at the same time have a kind of humorous emotional reaction but also be thoughtful about it i mean improv isn't always funny sometimes improv is very serious and that's okay too um, but it's often in that in that seriousness that we eventually find humor. So um, that's a fun one to kind of experiment with if you have a unknown ahead of you or something that your your team is worried about. Other thoughts about that one? Could you other, imagine other ways to use that one? Fortunately, unfortunately. I appreciated you you sharing that last part up 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 until what you had just said. I was seeing these as really good ways of maybe teaching principles, mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, draw the parallels from them. But, but actually you just, you just told us how we could actually use this to do the work. Yeah. To, yeah. to use that one to actually do work we need to do. I like that. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I think there's a lot of improv games that can be repurposed into ways that we do stuff there. So there's a, um, I haven't figured out how to do this one on zoom yet, but there's a improv game called red ball that I use a lot or used a lot when I was in person with people to teach people about work and process. Um, you, you stand in a circle and um, I, as the sort of leader of it, I would basically say, I have a red ball. It's intangible and invisible, right? But I would say I have a red ball. Um, and that intangible and invisible piece is actually a good um, analogy to the kind of work that people who work in software do which is that the work that we do is intangible and invisible. And yet somehow we have to pass it around organizations and turn it into a thing. Um, so I would start with a red ball and I'd say the, the rules are I'm going to throw a red ball at somebody else and they have to catch it. But because it doesn't exist, we have to have some ways that we pass information beyond me just actually throwing the thing. So I would get somebody's eye contact and I would say red ball so they know what I'm throwing them because, again, it doesn't exist red ball and I would throw it. And if I was throwing it to you, Steve, then you would catch it and you would say, thank you, red ball. And that's to make sure that I know that the transaction successfully happened. Right. So we start by throwing this red ball around. So it's red ball. Thank you, red ball, red ball. Thank you, red ball. And it's kind of everybody just paying attention to each other in the circle. Then I start throwing new things in, throwing a yellow ball and then a green ball. And then I start getting really silly and I throw in like pink scissors and like a, a skunk I might throw in like Bernie Sanders or Beyonce or something, right? Like just adding more and more things and some things that are like really interesting and funny and some things that are disgusting um, as we kind of go around and we keep doing that. And what eventually happens as if you're familiar with work and process issues is that the system falls apart, right? There becomes a moment when there's too many things and we don't remember who has what or people have too many things in their hands. And I always stop the game and I check in at the end and I look for everything that I've thrown into the game. And inevitably, we will have lost some things. Some things will have magically duplicated or they will have changed. Like there'll be a blue ball. And I'm like, I never created a blue ball. And then we talk about how like in really busy systems, work systems, this is what happens to projects, right? What happened to that project? I don't know. Why did you start that project? That wasn't a project we were working on. Well, I don't know. He gave it to me, right? Like it's just, a, it's a great way. So there are lots of improv games that you can repurpose into understanding um, how our work world works because it uh, improv uses human systems and so does our work world. So that's a really fun one. I'm happy to get, I have like a how to on that one. So if you're ever gonna be around live people again, I'm happy to share that one with you because it is great. 
Um, I do it with executives all the time because they're the ones who have the biggest problem with work in process. Yeah. They don't mean it. They just get excited about ideas. Um, so yeah, so let's let's do one more. We have a few more minutes. Um, and this one, I, I, now I'm going to put you in a place where I do want to like put get up a couple of people who are brave enough to um, sort of be in the spotlight because this is really a game where um, you have kind of two people playing and everybody else we all I guess just get to watch and and see how amazingly fun it is and we can do this a couple rounds. Um, so if two people would be willing to volunteer, um, it's not hard. I'll, let me explain the game first, and then you can tell me if you're comfortable volunteering. Um, so this game, I want to make sure I'm giving it the right name. Um, oh, yeah, it's just called commercial. So the idea is somebody is going to volunteer to just grab something from their house. It can be anything, right? Like you could grab um, like my like aquaphor. I could grab um, I have a random wand in my thing, right? So you just grab something from your house and you are going to be modeling it, right? Like showing it in the screen. Like this is, you're the part of the commercial that's like showing the object. The second person, yes, is going to be doing the voiceover and you're going to narrate the use of this object. The only rule is whatever you are describing, describing can absolutely not be what this object is used for. Right? You are describing this object for a use of which it is absolutely not intended. And the person who's kind of showing it is get, you know, you kind of got to work together here to turn it in. So like, let's say I was, you know, somebody was modeling this. And if it was me doing the voiceover, I could be like, oh, we're very excited to introduce you to our new product. It's called iSlick. And um, it goes on your eyes and it makes them very slippery and it allows you to see through walls, right? I mean, you're just like goofing, right? It doesn't, there's no right or wrong here. You can say anything you want. You just can't say this is for dry lips, right? It, it's just something else. It's a different thing. Does that make sense? And you only go for like a minute and then we stop and we can flip it around to somebody else. So this is a good one to just like uh, put your brain in a place where like now you're you're creating something this I guess I I use this game when I want people to become innovative when I want them to think outside of their normal world when I want them to start thinking about the world through different eyes right when we're sort of stuck in our standard thing and plus it's just super funny and teams laugh really hard when they do it so so can I get two volunteers a modeler and a voiceover person Okay, Heather's in. Who's going to be her partner? Do you want me to do the first one? Will that feel better? I'll do the first one. I'll do the first one and then you guys can see how easy it is. Heather, do you want to do the modeling or do you want to do the voice? You've got modeling it is. Okay. All right. So bring your, bring your item up so I get a chance to see it. Okay. Are you ready? Um, we are so excited to invite you here to this infomercial today for our new product. It is a head shrinker. Um, everybody has been complaining recently about how heads are too big. I know you've probably heard it at home. And um, so we've come up with this amazing new product. Um, what you will do is you will think really, really hard about the size of your head by looking at our new head shrinking object. And um, by applying just a little bit of electricity, your head will actually shrink down to the size of the object. And then you will be able to fit it through things that you weren't able to fit it through before. That's it. I'm done. Right. Does that make any sense? No. Uh, where did that come from? I don't know. It's shaped like a head. Okay. But that's, that's what we're trying to do here. And the idea is like, there's nothing wrong. You can't say any wrong thing. You're just saying something that this thing makes you think of, but I can't say that it's a light bulb. Does the describer have to follow the modeler or does it work? You're supposed, you should work a little together. The modeler should be maybe like trying to kind of like work along with the describer of like, oh, it's a head thing. Like, ooh, let me show you how you put like in front of my head, right? So that we're kind of, you're kind of helping build off of each other. Does that make sense? All right, so let's get, we get, we have probably have time for at least one of these. I know there's two brave souls in this world. Who wants to play? All right, Jonathan's in. Who's gonna be his partner in crime? Jonathan, do you want a voiceover or do you wanna do the object? The object. I, I happen to have a bicycle. Wait a minute. Evan looks like he wants to do it. Evan, you Evan, can voice you over. Your you can voice uh, over. You get, I guess I can voice over. Put it I over close to the camera so we can see it, Jonathan. I am taking off my virtual back. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Ah, that would that would help. Okay, there. put it closer to the camera. It's very small. Make it make it bigger for us. 
Oh, okay. You don't even need to know what that is, Evan, but it's fabulous. All right, go for it, sir. Okay, Jonathan. So uh, I am happy to announce that our latest product is ready to come to market. And what this object, what our product is, it's something that is going to allow you to, uh, to cook much more quickly. So it's a miniaturization item that you can put next to ingredients. So let's say you have a bag of flour, a bag of sugar and three sticks of butter. You put it next to all three of those and then you press the buttons on the top and walk away for 10 minutes and you will have a cake. And it is doing this through the super intelligent cakeifying technology. It also has an upgrade that can be used to create uh, salsa and chips. You can set out tomatoes and onions and jalapeno peppers and chips, and you have to press the button on the bottom because, well, the, the bottom is for spicy things, the top is for sweet things. And I, I think we're uh, about ready to see a demonstration. We have some of the chips in the oven because these are special chips with cheese melted on top. And it is all done by our special food making device. I don't know what happened to Jonathan. I'm worried about him. <laughs> that was amazing, Evan. Where did he go? Oh, Thank you. Beautiful. Jonathan's he's probably yeah. sprinting back from his kitchen right now. The oven must <laughs> have- uh, I've got to get some props. Caught fire or something. <laughs> Perhaps he was accidentally <laughs> miniaturized. Yeah. Oh, ooh. <laughs> ooh, he had shrunk. So Evan, what? Tell me about that experience of doing that. What? What was? How? What was happening for you while you were doing that? As I was talking, I initially was trying to just figure out what that thing is, and I just got into the idea. I just had lunch before saying, okay, food, food, food. It makes food instantly. And once I had the idea of it makes food instantly, it was very easy then to start talking about, well, you, you press the button and it makes the food and then you press another button and it can make different kinds of food. Yeah. So the stressful part was initially, what, what, what am I going to say? And it was almost like first thing that pops in your head, just say it's that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. I didn't have the props to follow him. Yeah. Especially not in this little space yeah. right here. In, in, yeah, I didn't say this, but in improv, we just like pretend we have props a lot. So you would be okay to just be like, you know, but yes, yeah, you're like, I want real props because you have a real thing, which makes total sense. Um, but you did a great job trying to kind of follow along with him. Um, and what you said, Evan, about like where, where to start. So if you guys ever do go see improv, what you'll notice is a lot of times they'll ask for a suggestion. And that is a way to one, engage the audience. And also, I mean, I'll tell you for really good improv teams, audiences often won't believe that it's not scripted. Like they don't believe they're like, you didn't just make that up because good improvisers, it looks very natural, but by getting a suggestion in the moment, it's a way for improvisers to sort of prove like we didn't know what you were going to say ahead of time. And we built around this and it solves Evan's problem, which is like, where do I start from? Right. So we'll often start an improv um, with a suggestion and just to bridge that back again to working with teams. If you wanted to help sort of build that um, innovation, sort of thinking outside of your normal reality muscle in your team, you could seed it with something real in their world. Right. So you could play this, but you could say like, let's do this. But like the, the sort of realm that we're working in is whatever your industry is or product is or whatever that you're going to go into and let people sort of goof around in that space. Um, Cause that can be a nice way to sort of bound it and make it more tied to our real, our work reality. Or you could just let them do it for fun and not worry about that. Um, cool. So I think that we've pushed almost to the end of the time box. I hope that you guys had fun doing that. Maybe you got some ideas of ways to play games. Um, if you just Google like improv games to play with teams, you will find a thousand things and don't be afraid to give them a try. Um, there's lots of YouTube videos showing you how to do them, but um, I just think hopefully you, you're starting to see what I saw, which is like, wow, improv has a lot to do with Agile. There you go.